Good afternoon and welcome. I'm Merit Jano, Dean of the School of International and Public Affairs at Columbia University, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you to SIPA's annual Donald and Vera Blinken Lecture. This year, this lecture, uh, we have an extraordinary speaker joining us, but every year the lecture has brought some amazing people to our campus and we're very grateful. The lecture is organized by the Center on Global Economic Governance and uh, throughout these years, we have had speakers such as Secretary General of NATO, Jens Stoltenberg, and we are honored today to continue this extraordinary tradition by welcoming the Honorable Jane Harmon to speak with us today. The topic of her lecture is Insanity is Not Destiny, Opportunities in National Security. Very topical and a very catchy title, which is also the title of her new book. She is really uniquely qualified and equipped to address this topic with really vast lifelong experience in both the defense and intelligence fields and Congress. I won't give you her full bio as it has been distributed, but I think many of you should be familiar with her remarkable career. She served for nine terms in Congress when she was on all of the major security committees, armed services, defense, homeland security, she now co-chairs the Homeland Security Experts Group with former Homeland Security Secretary Michael Chertoff, and she has served and serves on numerous corporate boards and think tanks, including the Aspen Institute. She's president emeriti of the Wilson Center, having completed a decade as its president and CEO. I'm looking forward to reading your book. Thank you so much, Jane, for being with us. We're really excited uh, to have you. Um, as this world gets more dangerous, the threats confront us from many different sources, increasing scale and complexity, and a very changing geopolitical context. Thinking through our national security is uh, never more crucial. I'd like to expend a special thanks also to Ambassador Donald and Vera Blinken for their generosity in endowing this lecture and their support of SIPA, uh, their interest in SIPA and the Center on Global Economic Governance. And with that, it's my pleasure to hand the mic, so to speak, over to Jan Spenor, our James Shotwell Professor of Global Political Economy, our Director of the Center on Global Economic Governance, an eminent economist and scholar who will lead us forward. Thank you very much, Jan. Thank you very much, Merit, and thank you all for joining us today. We are definitely most pleased to have today in the special program uh, the very esteemed uh, distinguished fellow and past president uh, of the Wilson Center, Representative Jane Harmon. Her vast experience will give us a unique point of view on the intricacies of the defense and intelligence community and the world around us. Um, uh, in her address, she will discuss the past and future um, of American national security. She will outline the opportunities as well as the challenges to making progress in these uh, complex and difficult issues. Just a few words about the Center on Global Economic Governance. Uh, we have been in existence for 10 years. We're fostering a more complete and nuanced understanding of today's complex world, the many developing trends, the global political, uh, social and economic uh, developments. And we are sponsoring and trying to pursue more in-depth research and actionally actionable policy proposals that will enhance the understanding of what's going on in the world today. And so I would like to thank uh, Dean Geno for uh, spearheading the uh, center within SIPA. I would, of course, like to thank uh, first and foremost to Ambassador Don Blinken and Mrs. Vera Blinken for supporting this lecture, which has indeed been uh, very, very important for a number of years now. Ambassador Blinken, as you know, has made a lasting impact in fields ranging from public service as <laughs> ambassador to Hungary from 1994 to 1998, his contribution in investment banking to education, arts patronage. Uh, throughout his uh, long estimable career, he was awarded a number of awards, including the US Department of Defense Award for Distinguished Public Service, as well as being the first U ambassador to receive 
the Republic of Hungary's highest civilian honor. Uh, together with him, Vera Blinken has served on the executive committee of the International Rescue Committee, and in 2002, for services to the Hungarian people, she was awarded the Middle Cross of the Republic of Hungary. Um, now, as uh, Mary Jeno mentioned, the Blinken lecture was delivered by a number of people, including the NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg. Uh, among the past speakers, we had uh, Pier Carlo Paduan, the Italian Minister of the Economy and Finance, Werner Hoyer, President of the European Investment Bank, the largest investment bank in the world, Ambassador Daniel Fried. We had Antonio Tajani, who was the President of the European Parliament at the time, and Wolfgang Schäuble, the then General German Minister of Finance. So we're very honored to have um, Jane Harmon today with us, uh, joining this roster of distinguished speakers. And uh, Jane, I would like to invite you to speak. Thank you very much. The floor is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I appreciate that, Jan and Merit. Thank you both for that introduction. I wish we were meeting actually, I was thinking about that, since I'm extremely fond of the Blinkens, more in a moment, uh, and I would love to see them. Maybe that will happen a few days after this. Uh, but um, this Zoom life is what we have, and I am extremely honored uh, to be asked to give this lecture this year. Uh, I have fond memories of meeting Ambassador Donald Lincoln in our embassy in Budapest. His office was located in the living room of an old manse, which is where Cardinal Mincenti lived for 15 years after the U.S. granted him asylum in 1956. I remember Ambassador Blinken said, this is the room. And I remember the fireplace. I remember the whole scene. Uh, throughout his estimable career, as Jan just said, Ambassador Blinken has made a lasting impact in fields ranging from public service to investment banking, to education and the arts. And as you heard, he served as ambassador to Hungary at a crucial time when Hungary was in process of joining NATO at the time of the referendum on NATO membership. Um, he played a defining role in setting up the logistical base for I-4, uh, the implementation force, and later for S-4, uh, the stabilization force in Bosnia and Herzegovina, uh, peacekeeping operations in the Balkans. Uh, to remind everyone, um, in the 90s, I was in Congress. Uh, we weren't paying enough attention, I don't think, to the threats against us, but there certainly was this huge problem. Uh, in Bosnia Herzegovina, and uh, the U.S. played a big role, and uh, the Blinkens were uh, in the center uh, of that. Uh, for his accomplishments, as Jan said, and his services as ambassador, among other things, he was awarded the first uh, Republic of Hungary's highest civilian honor. Uh, it's a big deal. And Vera Blinken, too, born in Budapest, uh, in part thanks to her courageous uh, parents, miraculously survived the Holocaust and World War II, and in the early 1950s, she and her mother managed to flee communist Hungary and found a welcoming home in New York. This story appeals to me since my own father grew up in uh, Nazi Germany, was in the last class where Jews could graduate, managed to flee to New York and began a successful career as a medical doctor there. I was born in New York, we moved to California. And he used to say, uh, growing up behind this little store in Köln, Germany, he dreamed of escaping to France, but he never imagined uh, getting to the United States and having two children, one of whom became a successful medical doctor, my brother, and the other of whom served in the United States Congress. And I can never tell that story without tilting up. Uh, he didn't live to the end of my congressional career, but he had a huge role in, in, in making me want to achieve what I, what I achieved. Vera attended Vassar College and graduated with a degree in art history. And while living in Hungary, as the wife of Donald Blinken, Ambassador Blinken, she founded Primavera, the first mobile breast cancer screening program in Central and Eastern Europe. And in 2002, she was awarded the Middle Cross of the Republic of Hungary for services to the, Repub to the Hungarian people. So pretty big deal, um, two very impressive people. And it is only fitting uh, that Columbia's premier university-wide lecture examining Europe's policy issues and foreign relations in a global context is named after them. And thank you again for the honor of giving this lecture. 
Uh, my first visit to Hungary was not as a member of Congress visiting Ambassador Blinken, but was during a Smith College summer in 1968. Just 12 years earlier, the Hungarian state security opened fire on an unarmed crowd of anti-Soviet pro protesters, setting off the Hungarian revolution. Although the Soviets put a brutal end to the uprising, a fire was lit and it didn't stop burning. It was clear when I was there that Hungary was a powder keg. After Janos Kadar became the head of the government, he gradually introduced liberalizing reforms, political prisoners and church leaders were freed, farmers and industrial workers were given increased rights and the new economic mechanism brought market style reforms to communist state management and allowed privately owned businesses to emerge. By the end of the 1980s, one third of Hungary's GDP was being generated by private business. In the late 80s, I returned to Hungary while serving uh, as an election observer in neighboring Czechoslovakia uh, with the National Democratic Institute called NDI. I vividly recall the Velvet Revolution, that's what it was called, and the night after the vote, 50,000 people holding small candles uh, flooded uh, the town square in beautiful Prague uh, and listened to Paul Simon, remember Paul Simon, who was a member of our delegation, uh, sing. It was magical. And the next years were so hopeful for both countries. But now sadly, um, Viktor Orban has moved Hungary backward and hope has dimmed. The kind of populism and anti-Semitism that Orban has come to represent is yet another challenge for the US and for the West and actually for the world. I have just written, as you heard, a policy memoir about the tough problems the US has not addressed uh, since the Cold War ended. My book is called Insanity Defense, Why Our Failure to Confront Hard National Security Problems Makes Us Less Safe. For anyone who doesn't know this, uh, insanity can be defined as doing the same thing over and over again and expecting a different result. As a nation, America has cycled through the same defense and intelligence issues since the end of the Cold War. Consider, at right after the Cold War, and this is when I was elected to Congress in the first post-Cold War class, we slashed defense and intelligence spending without a strategy for what the world would look like. We blew off numerous terrorism warnings and then created a homeland security apparatus neglected and abused and misused by successive presidents and Congresses. We ran the intelligence community, I know quite a bit about this, on a 1947 business model. That's when the National Security Act, which is still the bedrock of our national security uh, law, was enacted. We only reformed our intelligence community after the Iraq debacle. And then sadly, we undermined it through repeated purges of experienced career leadership. We ignored the constitution and the Geneva conventions when detaining and interrogating so-called enemy combatants. We adopted a massive extrajudicial domestic surveillance program. And we allowed successive presidents to conduct military operations drone strikes and arms sales launched without congressional approval or adequate oversight. I was there throughout much of this period as witness, legislator, exhorter, enabler, dissident, and eventually outside advisor and commentator. I helped craft key legislation with Republican counterparts and provided bipartisan support for policies and approaches on detention, surveillance, military intervention, and so forth, some of which I came to regret. Some I'm very proud of, but some of the things that I lent my name to, I came to regret. Uh, American leaders did not realize soon enough that the institutions and habits formed during the Cold War were no longer effective in an increasingly multipolar world transformed by digital technology and driven by ethno-sectarian conflict. Nations that became rising centers of economic and political power, freed from the fear of the Soviets, no longer deferred to America as before. And yet we settled into a comfortable, at times arrogant position as the lone supervisor 
<laughs> has the loan, that too, has the loan superpower, a self-described indispensable nation. At the same time, our governing institutions, which had stayed resilient if imperfect through multiple crises, began their own unraveling. Our post-Cold War miscalculations and vulnerabilities were exposed dramatically on September 11, 2001. And some have not been fundamentally addressed in the years since. So now we're in the fourth decade after the Cold War, and we still need a strategy. There's good news. And the good news is that our newly minted Secretary of State, Tony Blinken, name may sound familiar to some of you, is advancing a concept to take, uh, what I say, uh, to take the foreign out of foreign policy, to make it relevant to average Americans by asking what we can do around the world to make us stronger here at home, and what we can do domestically to make us stronger abroad. This approach has reframed foreign policy for the modern era, making it clear to Americans whose firsthand exposure to the coronavirus, domestic terrorism, and the ravages of climate change show why these issues matter to them. I still vividly remember conducting town halls while a member of Congress and hearing from constituents, uh, angry constituents, that foreign aid needed to be discontinued because it ate up 50% of our federal budget. Well, oops, the right number was under 1%. Uh, but the broadly held misconception shows how disconnected foreign policy was, and in, in many cases is, from the minds of so many Americans. So let me just briefly sketch uh, a few major foreign policy challenges where this new approach of taking the foreign out of foreign policy will be tested. And I think, I hope, that the team will pass the test. First, pand pandemic diplomacy. Uh, this is our top domestic and international problem, domestic and international problem. It's also our top, to me, domestic and international opportunity. Our version of the Chinese Belt and Road Initiative, because if we do this right, we can find the way American leadership and innovation to get vaccines produced by US companies into the world's arms. It's the way to reclaim U.S. moral authority and to advance U.S. leadership. Also to advance business and tourism. None of us have been able to go anywhere for a year. A total win. So pandemic diplomacy is my top challenge and my top opportunity, I think, for this administration and for the U.S. We've already made tremendous strides. Under President Donald Trump, the U.S. refused to participate not only in the uh, WHO, but also in the COVID-19 vaccine global access facility called COVAX. Upon taking office, President Biden reversed this stance immediately and contributed $4 billion, making the US the largest donor to the effort. But we've got catching up to do. So far, the US has been somewhat upstaged by Russia and China, who have aggressively marketed and distributed their vaccines to foreign countries largely to advance their foreign policy goals. While Russia is using the vaccine to bolster its image and investment prospects and to drive a wedge between EU countries, China is donating doses to gain leverage in territorial disputes and further expand its influence. Both have even made efforts to undercut the US right in our own backyard by supplying vaccines to Latin America. However, and this is something I I, I profoundly believe we can't fall into the trap of trying to outplay our competitors at their own game, handing out vaccines to specific countries solely based on their geostrategic uh, importance. We need to play our game and win at our game. And President Biden must pursue the same approach abroad that he has proclaimed at home, one of all in unity. Uh, around the vaccine and the science that created it. Let's just marvel at the science. Moderna was just a small biotech firm in Cambridge, Massachusetts that nobody had ever heard of until Operation Warp Speed 
a Trump administration uh, initiative for which they deserve a lot of credit, infused it uh, with a large amount of money. Now it's one of three vaccine manufacturers in the US and it has the, that has produced the arsenal to fight the virus. And it has, the, the Moderna version has the same effectiveness as the Pfizer vaccine. And it's really a testament to US uh, innovation. A second issue that I think is on my, my top list is climate change. Climate change is an existential threat to humanity. In many regions, global warming has caused an increase of 1.5 degrees Celsius above pre-industrial levels, and more than one-fifth of all humans currently live in places with this increase. Doesn't sound like much, but when you understand its effects on uh, fish and uh, climate and, and uh, the, the weather patterns, it, it is a, a devastating increase. July drought, uh, drought levels have hit my home state of California in April. And so there is absolutely no doubt there will be just another catastrophic uh, fire season. Could start any time. Worse, climate-related risks are found to be generally higher at lower altitudes and for disadvantaged people and communities. This should be obvious in terms of where disadvantaged people and communities live. So it's a double whammy, access to uh, the, the uh, vaccine and then living in places that are gonna be hard hit by climate. This is bringing foreign policy home, sadly. The average carbon footprint for a person in the US is 16 tons, one of the highest rates in the world. Globally, the average is closer to four tons. As the second largest contributors to and beneficiaries of global carbon emissions, we need to own up to the problem. Uh -huh. The appointment of John Kerry as the US uh, Special Presidential Envoy for Climate is inspiring. And I read that he's headed to China soon. Uh, the US has much to contribute. We need to scale up investments in clean, green infrastructure globally, in addition to encouraging leadership from the finance and investment community in solar, wind, and cutting edge technologies, such as electric vehicles. I happen to own one. I hope you do too. Uh, mobilizing climate action is necessary if we ever want to bend the emissions curve. And we desperately need to do that. Third issue, China. In regard to China, we must confront, cooperate, and compete at the same time. In other words, we need to play a game of three-dimensional chess. Again, we've made a good start with uh, Secretary Blinken's trips to Asia and then to Alaska, where our delegation met with the Chinese. Uh, there was a lot of coverage uh, 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 about uh, uh, the Chinese reaction uh, in public uh, to that meeting in Alaska. But rumor has it that the private meeting was very friendly. And so one has to wonder whether that, that public uh, stink, to quote the North Koreans, was more directed at domestic consumption in China than at uh, China's uh, 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 disinterest in, in moving forward in, in some form of cooperation. Speaking of stink, uh, one of the other things that trip did was uh, resume US uh, military operations with South Korea, I thought that was a very good move. Uh, the North Koreans uh, objected and, and, and resumed uh, um, uh, missile tests. But again, uh, our muted response to that showed something that I think is just absolutely crucial. And that is that we're playing our game, not theirs. Confident that they know that carrying out any form of nuclear attack on us and our allies would, would risk their annihilation. Uh, alas, our quest for a containment agreement with North Korea, in my view, was made harder uh, when President Trump unilaterally abrogated the Iran deal. And getting back to a form of Iran deal and North Korea deal uh, will be a challenge. And many predict they have to be done in some uh, combined form. And I think that is probably right. But again, I think we have uh, the right team uh, to focus on the issues. Uh, the early pieces of the new Biden doctrine include China and Afghanistan, in both cases involving allies. The centerpiece of the new, new China strategy is the Quad. China, uh, um, Alaska, <laughs> excuse me, is the Quad. Australia, Japan, India, and the U.S., which will become an economic and military alliance. Again, that was part of the Asia visit. The big bet of this administration is on India. 
still unaligned in certain respects, but becoming a close US ally. And I think that's a very clever strategy. Sadly, we will not in the short term rejoin TTIP, which is the uh, Asia Trade Alliance that we were part of and pulled out of. Uh, we won't join it because we don't have pro-trade majorities uh, in either party, in either House of Congress, big loss as far as I'm concerned. I was proudly a pro-trade Democrat, um, but the Quad hopefully will become a, a, a variation on what we could have achieved uh, under, under, uh, uh, under TTP. Uh, fourth, and, and let me, I'm gonna close on this, um, getting Congress back in the game as a serious foreign policy partner, a role it played uh, for much of the 20th century will be a key to restoring US leadership. When Congress originally passed the 2001 Authorization for Use of Military Force called the AOMF in response to the September 11 attacks, it was intended, and I know this because I voted for it as did every member of Congress except one, it was intended to authorize military action in Afghanistan against those who attacked us. Seemed the right thing to do. I still think it was the right thing to do. But since then, it's become a blank check for military action used to justify 41 operations in 19 countries, including against groups like ISIS, which didn't even exist on 9-11. No doubt President Biden agrees it should be updated, but that duty falls to Congress, which remains uh, full of toxic political division. If Congress could abandon its threadbare politics and bring both sides of the aisle together to get things like treaties passed uh, by a two thirds vote or a 60 vote margin, uh, that's what the filibuster requires, it would be much easier to persuade our allies to trust us again, knowing that the next president isn't gonna pull out of commitments on a win. Uh, having Congress on board means we would carry a much bigger stick. This is something Joe Biden knows to his bones since he spent so many decades uh, in the foreign policy arena in Congress and has friends in both parties in Congress and cut so many of the bipartisan deals personally. Uh, but again, it's a mixed bag. Uh, Congress has proved intransigent in some ways, but it also showed thought leadership on long-term challenges and opportunities in the recent past when it created, uh, get this, a national quantum initiative to ensure that the United States maintains its leadership advantage in quantum information science and its technology applications. The program is designed to accelerate research and development for America's economic and national security. And for those who are not familiar, quantum science could break cryptography, design novel chemicals and materials, and image individual molecules. Uh, this is a cutting edge scientific technology and on a bipartisan basis, uh, Congress is embracing it. Other nations are paying attention. China carried out a su successful demonstration of a quantum satellite uh, four years ago, but because Congress acted when it did, the US has a chance to cement its lead in research and development in this revolutionary technology. As we plan for the future and try to learn from past mistakes, it is critical to understand that our actions and responses well into the 21st century must be nuanced and won't fit in neat boxes that governments are so fond of. I, have, I say often that our, politics, uh, our, our, our politicians are analog and our problems are digital. Well, yes, they are. And photo ops and press releases are not a foreign policy. It's complicated. President Biden has the most experienced foreign policy uh, team uh, maybe ever, but certainly since George H.W. Bush. And he is the most experienced foreign policy president since George H.W. Bush, who with Ronald Reagan uh, ended the Cold War. Uh, that may explain in part why we have gone three decades without the strategy that we need. What Biden brings is deep experience with world leaders, decades in Congress, and empathy, we all know this, for those hard on their luck. But it will take a village. And universities, think tanks, NGOs are part of that village. So hopefully, 
those at Columbia who run these uh, wonderful centers uh, are listening to me and uh, thinking about what they can do individually and collectively in addition to the better moves that our current government is making. So in conclusion, will we squander another decade? Well, my answer, don't laugh, Lincolns, I'm trying this. Nem me nem fagunk, fagunk. That is, I see Vera laughing, did I get it? Nem me nem fagunk, that's Hungarian for no, we won't. I hope I got it. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you very much, Jay. This was a, a real tour de force from uh, identifying the need for a successful strategy. I think that's crucial. And then identifying the main challenges and opportunities and uh, bringing them together, providing the synthesis, which is so much needed here. Um, we'll open it up for discussion. Let me start by asking one question, which kind of goes from or builds on what you're saying in terms of what's needed. And in particular, I think what uh, you've identified very clearly among other things is that Russia and China have strategies. They understand power and use power when they see there is no power against them. Uh, and, um, and so the question that naturally arises is whether the transatlantic cooperation, the two powers, Europe and the US, whether they can reestablish in some sense the successful partnership be it uh, political, military, economic, which has uh, characterized the uh, decades since World War II, and obviously has been shaken uh, over the last several years. And uh, so it comes as part of your four challenges and opportunities. And I wonder if you could like, would like to elaborate just briefly on where you see the perspective there. Um, well, I hope it will happen. I mean, I was there at, at many of the Munich Security Conference uh, meetings where, uh, Things were said about Article 5, the common defense provision of NATO, and um, uh, attitudes were shown, and it was uh, quite chilling. I mean, the U.S. is a charter member of NATO, and I would remind everybody that on 9-11, without being asked, NATO invoked Article 5, the only time it ever has, uh, and was prepared to come to our common defense. And uh, uh, to see it disparaged was heartbreaking. I'm sure you heard a lot about this from your speaker last year. Um, but uh, Joe Biden and team have made it crystal clear, and I think Tony Blinken and others are in Europe now, uh, that we are re-engaging with allies, which doesn't mean that every alliance that we are in or back in is perfect. NATO needs modernization. NATO actually has modernized to some extent and has now cyber capacity and things it didn't have. It needs more modernization. The UN needs modernization, the WHO needs modernization, the WTO needs modernization, but we need to be there and we need, need to be driving that modernization as an indispensable partner, not just indispensable power. Uh, our partnership is much stronger than our individual uh, uh, actions. You know, the whole is, is greater than the sum of the parts. Uh, so let me make that point. Uh, Europe has been, uh, uh, in it, it's, it, Europe is not the old Europe, uh, just as the US isn't the old US either. I'm sure we'll talk about that. Uh, and the pull of Russia in terms of this uh, pipeline to Germany, which Germany wants and the rest of Europe doesn't. Uh, and uh, a lot of the efforts by Chinese, uh, by the Chinese to trade with Europe are making it harder for us to uh, make this uh, alliance as strong as it can be but it is absolutely indispensable if we're gonna resist the threats from Russia and China. They're not the same threats. I mean, Russia is a declining power, truly a declining power, but with a very cagey leader uh, who is willing to um, uh, uh, be, uh, as uh, Joe Biden has said, a killer, literally, of people who oppose him and to sow chaos around the world. And he does it very cleverly as 40,000 troops at the Ukrainian border at the moment. He's gotten away with taking over Crimea. Uh, and uh, we have to worry about that. China differently is not a declining power. China is, depending on how you go, uh, either a rising or a risen power. A lot of folks at the Wilson Center call it a risen power. It's a different economy from ours. We didn't think that would happen, uh, but guess what? It happened when we weren't paying enough attention uh, shame on us, but at any rate, it happened. 
they have a very different economy uh, and a huge market, which we want to be in. So as I said, we have to learn how to play three-dimensional chess uh, on that. And, and hopefully, uh, one of the partners on our side of that chess uh, board is uh, Europe. Yeah, no, I, think, I think that's exactly the right, the right way to proceed. And, and as you stress, having uh, uh, our game being the game that's being played is, is very important. Um, I'm looking at the questions that come uh, along, and one of them uh, that uh, relates to this also is uh, to what extent um, in the current world where we have democracies as well as increasingly more authoritarian governments, how do we handle those? How do we handle that world? And how far do we go in collaborating with different countries, different regimes? Well, to be fair uh, to the rest of the world, our democracy is not in great shape at the moment. Uh, I, I sure everyone is as horrified as I am at these repeated uh, incidences of, of white on black uh, violence uh, uh, perpetrated by our police. Uh, this last one was maybe, maybe an accident, um, but the others don't seem to be. That's one incident. Uh, our state's cutting back on voting rights uh, is horrifying to me. Uh, and, and, and more than that, I'm in Washington, D.C., and I was here on January 6th, I was not in the Capitol, but I, I never thought in my lifetime that I would see anything like that. So we have a lot of work to do at home to restore our own democracy to the intention of our founders and actually to make it, to build back better. Uh, our democracy has to be inclusive. We are evolving into a minority majority country that should not be terrifying to everybody. Uh, it's not terrifying to me. I grew up in California, which is already my, my minority majority. And uh, I, I don't even think those are the right terms. But diversity is a strength of America. Immigration is a strength of America. And uh, so I, I think we have a lot of work to do here. Uh, and we need to be a little shamefaced about criticizing other people for human rights records. I mean, even the Chinese made a good point in Alaska about that. On the other hand, uh, it is uh, hugely disturbing to see what's going on in Myanmar, to see the concentration camps. I mean, for those of us who have this history in Europe with the Nazis in, in, in China, to see China buzzing uh, the uh, East China Sea and you know, being provocative that way, to see uh, basically, and I, 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 you know, I shudder to think, uh, the end of democracy in Hong Kong and, and the threats to Taiwan, and to see, the, as I mentioned, the rise of authoritarianism in Eastern Europe and especially in Hungary. Who would have thought? Especially Viktor Orban. I thought he was supposed to be a good guy. I see, Vic, I see Vera nodding. He was a good guy before he was a bad guy. And uh, uh, what do we do about that? Well, again, play our game. Live our values. Perfect democracy in America. A lot of people still want to come to America. Uh, and, and, and go, come to our great university system and uh, work in these cutting edge uh, science and, and uh, technology firms that we have. Uh, and so I think uh, this may not get fixed overnight, but I think um, we're gonna have to be a little tolerant and work with some people who are doing some things we don't approve of, uh, but hopefully they will, as uh, to, you know, to, to borrow uh, Martin Luther King's um, metaphor, the arc will bend uh, toward, toward the kind of democracy uh, that, that we embrace. And just one last comment. I, I talked about the Quad and our big bet is on India. Uh, it is on India. Uh, India is becoming a, an increasingly good friend of ours. And India is a buffer against both China and Russia. Uh, India is probably going to buy the S-400 missile defense system uh, from Russia. This is something Turkey just did, a, a NATO ally. We don't like this, but does that mean we're gonna cut off ties with uh, India? No, I don't think it does mean that. Uh, it means we've expressed our displeasure, uh, but I think uh, we're gonna have to understand that uh, you know, the perfect can't be the enemy of the good. And if we can build better relationships there for the reasons I just stated, we need to do it. I think that's a very important point that diversity of approaches that uh, friendly countries like India may have in particular areas should not prevent uh, uh, yeah. collaborating wherever we can. And so I think I think that's very important. Your other point about Viktor Orban is, is very well taken. Here's an example of somebody who actually 
was sponsored. He had a short scholarship fellowship at the beginning, looked very pro-Western, and then uh, suddenly, you know, turned completely. So that's also a lesson that we have to uh, learn in a way. And the third point you made that um, America is still very attractive for young people. I can certainly confirm. I work a lot in Central Eastern Europe, Prague, mm -hmm. place. Uh, you mentioned you were there. And oh. uh, yes, America is definitely um, the beacon and uh, we should do whatever we can. And uh, we have lots of students from all over the world, including you know Europe, of course, and Colombia. And so in that sense, uh, we definitely are carrying the torch uh, in that direction. Speaking of Colombia, we have, um, uh, a couple of questions which I'll bring together. Um, uh, one of them says, at Columbia, we have a very strong quantum initiative in physics. Would it be better to have a very broad initiative that includes policy and strategy too? And that relates to a previous question that somebody posed saying, look, uh, we are a country that's uh, obviously a leader in technology and artificial intelligence and everything else. Are we utilizing it enough or could we actually do more and uh, in charting our strategy and charting our game that we want to play? Well, I think uh, advanced technologies and, and what they can do for good and what they can do for, for bad has to be connected to policy goals. Uh, that doesn't mean the government runs it all. The government shouldn't run it all. The government should do basic research more than it has done. Uh, I told the story of Moderna I mean, good on Trump. I, I can't think of a lot of things I applaud about his administration, but uh, Operation Warp Speed and the USMCA, the US-Mexico-Canada Agreement are two that I think would not have happened without him. Uh, so uh, Moderna was a small company, uh, presumably with very smart people that didn't have the capital uh, to become the player it now is. And in quantum uh, mechanics and in AI and all the rest of this, uh, the lead is in the private sector and the universities. And so I think our goal has to be uh, in some coordinated way, again, not top down, probably horizontally coordinated, uh, to make sure that we have thought through what these technologies can be and how they're used. Um, uh, people may have read that uh, some of the um, professionals at Google uh, refused to do business with DOD fairly recently. Google had an AI contract with uh, DOD. Um, and I, I think that Google withdrew the contract. I'm not positive. I think DOD should be working on AI. And I think DOD should be working with firms like Google. I'm not telling the, Google's employees what, how they should behave. But my point is that um, these technologies are going to be used around the world and they have you know, they have benefits as well as detriments. So let's understand them better and let's link them in. And this is something Columbia could take the lead on. Absolutely could with the different uh, centers that you have, uh, lashing them up in a way that, that, that contributes to the common good, not the common uh, bad. Yeah, no, I think you're absolutely right. In fact, the Central Global Economic Governance, we're doing precisely that in the area of economics trying to get new ideas, uh, stimulating ones, and applying them to public policy. And I think your uh, point is, can very well be illustrated uh, with the development of the internet, which started within the Department of Defense, right. then moved to the universities, and then moved into the commercial sector. So it was, in a way, an ideal way of how to generate totally new invention, and then leading to a successful global application. Well, we have something called InQtel, which is a, uh, a, a, a venture capital firm that the defense, well, that the intelligence community started. And we have something similar at the Defense Department to seed innovation in cutting edge work that will help uh, both the intelligence and defense departments. And I'm, it's, it's a variation on uh, what you're saying. And I think these are very good initiatives. That's excellent, right. And I think that there, again, one can bring uh, the Europeans and Americans together. Yeah. We also do it, Colombia, our faculty, student body, very international. So uh, this is something where, where we indeed can, uh, you know, can move a step further. Uh, let me see if we have any other uh, questions that have arrived in the meantime here. Um, I don't see anything here. Let's see here. Um, here it is. Uh, uh, President Biden is requesting 753 billion for national defense, 1.7% increase over President Donald Trump's military budget last year. Do you see a future in which we spent less on defense budgets and a militarization 
and more on peace building efforts, domestic aid, and non-military foreign aid? I love that question. Whoever asked that, thank you. So uh, I represented uh, in Congress an aerospace dependent district in Southern California where we make most of the cutting edge intelligence satellites. Uh, that's how I kind of got into my, my line of work. I had some experience before that as special counsel to the Defense Department, but I learned a lot and I defended all kinds of, of, uh, of defense uh, projects uh, because that was the economic engine for my district. Looking back on it, this is one of the things I admit in the book, uh, some of these things were absolutely necessary and still are, especially our investment in space. Space drives most of our defense products and we have to not only invest in it, but keep it safe uh, from uh, attacks by other countries. But what is the right amount to spend on defense? The answer is whatever it costs to defend against current and future threats not to defend against the threats of the Cold War or World War II. And we keep investing in legacy systems uh, because they're built in somebody's district and they represent a lot of jobs. And what we should be doing is weaning away from those jobs. In fact, in my own district, when we cut the defense and, and intelligence uh, procurement budgets, we, we started some, we, we really focused on dual use technology. So, Aerospace firms that had made defense products could make civilian products using a lot of the same machinery and know-how. Uh, that kept people employed. It also did better things. So with that concept, we ought to think of weaning ourselves away from stuff we don't need. And oh, by the way, the Chinese in particular are building a lot of that stuff, the old stuff. So let's not just say because they built three more submarines, we need three more submarines. No, we don't. We need, we need the right defenses against cyber, against possible AI attacks, against uh, asymmetric attacks, against terrorism. Uh, those are the things, and uh, to give the Defense Department credit, those are the things we need to study and understand. And then the right number for our defense budget, I don't know what that number is, is whatever it costs to fund that. And that is gonna be a hard political jump, but that's what we should do. When you asked about soft power, um, uh, Joe Nye, who teaches at Harvard, sorry, it's not Columbia, but he's a lovely man. I'm sure we all know him. I certainly do. Coined the term soft power and hard power and smart power. Uh, but we need to beef up our soft power. We underinvested in it. I say this in my book after the Cold War, after the uh, after 9 11, uh, we underinvested in it and we over militarized our response and the use of drones and the use of uh, and the setting up of prisons and the way we handle people. Uh, instead of uh, persuading hearts and minds, uh, built more enemies against us. So it was after a short period of time, a very uh, counterproductive strategy. And I think now that Tony Blinken, um, with that name that sounds familiar, uh, has, has the right idea. He's beefing up the State Department. He's uh, sending envoys to the right places. The appointment of John Kerry, as I said, is inspired. Having a senior guy, a former, uh, senior leader of, of the Senate and a former uh, Secretary of State be our envoy on climate is brilliant. That's soft power. And that's the one issue, may, maybe COVID is the other, where we can build a community of nations around the world, where we have to. I mean, COVID and climate don't know uh, national boundaries. And so if we don't do it as a world, we don't do it. And so I, yes, beef up the State Department, increase that budget, restore those parts that have been decimated and the morale in the Foreign Service and uh, get young people to wanna go there. I mean, one of the sad things is the Wilson Center was all, always full of people who, were, who came for a year or two um, until they got their clearances and wanted to join the Foreign Service or join some form of, of, uh, of service to the world, non-military service. And, uh, a lot of those people came and said, no, we don't want to do that anymore. We'd rather just stay here, which is nice because the Wilson Center got smart people, but it's not nice because we were not recruiting the best and brightest. Yeah, no, you're right. That's, that's very important that the institutions that are complementary indeed play the part that people move up and acquire the skills, experience, and then uh, and continue. Yeah. There is a question here which relates to um, uh, China that we that we just uh, talked about, and I I'll just give us a background to the question. Um, one statistic that is striking is that um, 
Chinese savings, uh, so amount of money that they have available for investment, which they use both domestically and around the world, equals the amount of savings that Europe and the United States generate together. Okay? The question in that context is, how can the US match geostrategic initiatives launched by China, such as the Belt and Road Initiative, when the US does not have the resources that China is ready to deploy for programs like Belt and Road Initiative? Well, again, I don't think, I think we're playing China's game. If we come up with all these statistics, how many submarines, how much savings, how many pick something um, uh, China has, and ooh, we've got to build that. That's their game, if the statistics are even accurate. What's our game? Our game, it seems to me, is rebuilding alliances, uh, being the, the COVID ambassador to the world, uh, which I think we can do more effectively and we have much better medicines than they do. And oh, by the way, I didn't even mention the fact that uh, everybody feels that they hid uh, the devastating impact of COVID for too long and let it get uh, you know, launched in the world. Uh, but at any rate, I, I think the right answer is to rebuild our economy with our allies, build a more resilient world economy and then guess what will happen? Savings rates will increase and we will not necessarily match dollar for you know, one or whatever, what they have, but we will get to a point, I think, where we have uh, a, a much broader shared economy than we do now. Income inequality is a big problem here. Uh, and we will have, uh, it seems to me, the wealth we will need. It's, it's not just about wealth, it's about resilience, it's about uh, uh, values. It's about um, uh, ability to defend ourselves against misguided uh, attacks. I think we'll, we'll get there faster than China will. That's, that's my bullish view of this. If I may, I, I would add to it one thing which people often underestimate, and that's the uh, human capital, right? That we sort Absolutely of right. uh, physical capital, but human capital is what's important. And, and in fact, that's where the U.S. still is at the forefront. That's where the students and everybody like to come, the best researchers and so on like to come here because- And, and let, yeah, and let's understand that uh, China has imprisoned an entire uh, uh, group of people who are now employed in manufacturing and other things. And that props up an economy in a very unfair way. And do we want that? Absolutely not, uh, absolutely not. I, I don't know if this is out of order, but I keep looking at oh. Vera. And I'm so curious about what happened to Viktor Orban. I, I have no idea. And you don't have to answer this, uh, Vera, but you, either Blinken might have a point of view. But I, I remember he was a good guy until he wasn't. And I just think this is one of the really perplexing things that's happened in our, in our international world. And you don't have to answer it if you don't want to. Donald. I, I could say something about Viktor Orban. Back in the 90s, when I was serving as the ambassador, I used to have the opposition party leaders to lunch two or three times a year. Orban was the head of the young uh, liberal party at the time. Mm -hmm. He had a very nice lunch every year. At the end of the lunch, I would say to Victor, Victor, if you were prime minister tomorrow, what would you do differently? He never answered that question. Uh -huh. so, the, so the key to Orban is that power is what motivates him more than anything else. Well, let that be a lesson. Um, let's select people in this country who think that serving the country is more important than gaining power or winning an election. Yeah. Yeah. So Jane, if I could shift a little bit, there is a question which okay. will draw on your uh, experience um, generally with anti-terrorism and security in the United States. Uh, and it's as follows. It says, focusing on the last attacks on the Capitol uh, on January the 6th and more recently on April 2nd, how the intelligence community should react to these internal threats to national security. Follow up, how can the government respond to the threat of far right extremism and white nationalist domestic terrorism? Well, that's a, that's a nice big question. Um, the, the attack on the Capitol on, on, on uh, January 6th was an insurrection. I don't think you can call it just a, an oops accident of, of anything. Uh, there was planning, uh, there were people who motivated those who attacked, there were people who attacked, and, you know, I, I don't take, take as innocent chatter, let's kill Mike Pence or Nancy Pelosi or any of the rest of it. 
the good news is uh, they were either inept or they were at inadequately organized to do any of those things. Uh, that's the good news. But our government was sadly exposed. And uh, why did that happen? There was intelligence that this, uh, certainly it was in the press. I, I don't get any classified briefings anymore, but you know, I could figure out that something bad was gonna happen on January 6th. I didn't know the dimensions of it, but everything from, from that initial information went wrong. There shouldn't have been a parade permit to go up to the Capitol. Uh, the whole parade should have been contained somewhere downtown or shifted over to Union Station, which is some blocks away. All of the law enforcement agencies should have been tightly coordinated. I did review the plan over you know, the, the inaugurations of presidents where everybody is both inside and outside the Capitol. It's a huge opportunity for you know, catastrophic attack. And we have the authorities put together and we have the air cover and all the rest of it. Why didn't that happen here? The only missing person from this event was the president himself, but the vice president was there and all the members of Congress uh, and it didn't happen. And all the finger pointing is all the finger pointing, but it should have happened days ahead. And I think that the lessons are being learned on, on both levels. Uh, but, but one of the sad things, you remember I, I said, Congress is broken, this toxic partisanship is horrific. Um, there is a proposal which is right to set up a 9-11 style commission. I know a lot about that, uh, both because my predecessor at uh, the Wilson Center Lee Hamilton, who was a very esteemed member of Congress before that and chaired the uh, House uh, Foreign Affairs Committee, et cetera, uh, was a co-chair of it with a Republican governor, Tom Kane of, uh, of New Jersey. And it was a nonpartisan effort to understand what happened and make uh, recommendations, one of which was uh, this uh, uh, reorganizing of the intelligence community to set up the director of national intelligence to coordinate across the intelligence community. Uh, I was a lead sponsor of that bill, and with Republicans, we enacted that. And having a DNI, hopefully a stronger leadership, is a, is a big improvement. And that came out of the 9-11 Commission. So where are we with the 1-6 Commission? We're nowhere. Why is that? Because each party's fussing about who gets to appoint whom on the 1-6 Commission. And I don't know where the, I don't know that this ever gets done. Uh, as, and it's a tragedy because this is a, a real time uh, to learn some lessons and we're gonna learn some of them, uh, but we're not gonna learn all of them because we can't get out of our own way. That's, that's amazing that in a way, this lack of ability to act, even on a, such a crucial issue where everybody, both parties who are involved and in danger, um, that one cannot find a resolution. Yeah, that's, that's tragic. You're absolutely right. Well, we, let's see if we have any other um, uh, question. There is one question. You mentioned the concentration camps and forced labor in China, uh, but could you speak about the prison industrial complex in the United States and forced labor in the US private and federal prison system? What can uh, we do to shift away from the high rate of incarceration in the United States and the threat this poses to democracy in the US and the global image as of the US as a free society? Well, Fair, uh, you know, in, in my defense, I did say we need to work on our democracy at home uh, before we lecture everybody else about human rights abuses. I don't think we have concentration camps here. I think we have uh, a justice system that desperately needs improvement. Uh, I'll confess, Joe Biden and I both voted for the crime bill in the early 90s. I voted for it because I thought there were a lot of uh, inequality, inequalities then, and that I thought it was an improvement. This is not my particular field. That bill led to, it made things worse. It didn't make things better. Uh, bad on me. Uh, you know, it's not the only mistake I made. Uh, but I think that there are some very smart people who understand prison reform. And I think the crucial thing right at the moment is police department reform. Uh, I, I am not in favor of defunding police. We need police. We should commend police. And the number of them who are good apples is, is probably 80%. But police training, and especially this uh, white on black violence is unacceptable in America. And I think it's good that we're having this George Floyd uh, trial, which is a, 
introduction for those in law school to you know how the US justice system works. And I, I think it is working in that trial, but right around it, uh, we've had two or three more examples. So you know, I think, I think something I would go for, in fact, I did, I almost lost my seat because I was for it. I voted to ban assault weapons in 1994. Uh, and, 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 and big ammunition clips. And to remind anybody that bill passed, it had a 10 year lifespan span when it expired and no one wanted to renew it. But at the time, the Democrats who were the uh, 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 proponents of the, of the law, Dianne Feinstein in particular, uh, was, you know, I, I give her huge credit for how gutsy she was. And she had come to power because her own mayor was shot with a, with a weapon. Um, uh, and then she became mayor and then she became uh, senator. But at any rate, um, by passing that law, uh, huge numbers of Democrats lost their seats, including Tom Foley, who was then Speaker of the House. He not only lost his speakership, but he, he lost his seat. Newt Gingrich came to power. Um, the, the, the pendulum swung. And we have never really been able to do much with gun control since. And we are out of, out of control in terms of gun violence in this country. And I don't think there's another country in the world that has that problem. Yeah, no, you're right. And I think the rest of the world, if it's looking at the US critically, this will be one of the key issues that yeah. they note. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so there's one question that's somewhat related. It says, um, uh, the question about um, a sort of cyber security, how should the U.S. Uh, deal with external cyber challenges like solar wind specifically? Is the U.S. government effectively structured and to deal with the related issues of U.S. citizens' privacy in dealing with cyber threats that emanate from inside? Well, uh, another uh, easy question. Um, David Sanger, who writes for the New York Times and also has been a scholar a couple times at the Wilson Center, wrote a book on cyber recently called The Perfect Weapon. It's the perfect weapon. It is uh, very secretive. Uh, you don't know you're hit until you're hit. Um, and defending against, preventing it, and then responding to it are really hard problems. Um, I'll get to privacy in a moment. In order to prevent a cyber attack, you really have to be in the other guy's network so that you know that he's attacking you. If you're in the other guy's network, he can think uh, that you're attacking him. So the chance of miscalculation is huge. What happened with solar winds and the uh, recent uh, uh, Chinese attacks is they got so smart, they entered US networks through US servers where we couldn't trace them. Uh, so we better get smarter about that and we better develop uh, domestic capability, which we don't have enough of aside from some private firms. Understand that solar winds was revealed by a private uh, 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 firm, not by the government. Government missed it for eight months. I mean, think, think embarrassing beyond embarrassing. And uh, I think it was 100 private firms and 20 government agencies, including uh, uh, some of our defense agencies got hit. Um, but we have to try to prevent these attacks. Then when they happen, uh, we have to be better at how to respond. It's tricky uh, because if we play tit for tat, we could end up in a bad place having our electric systems taken down or you know, pick one of these things. So uh, we have to get better at how we respond and we have to try to develop international mechanisms. And this is being talked about. And I give, again, the Biden administration credit to try to set some of the, the rules, uh, you know, rules of the road for cyber, just the way we have had international mechanisms to set the rules of the road for nuclear weapons. And um, uh, I think the chances that cyber could be deadly are much greater than that nuclear weapons would be used uh, because I think countries understand like North, North Korea that they'll be annihilated if they're used. So um, it's, it's a problem from hell to quote Samantha Power and uh, we got to work harder. The Biden appointments yesterday are really good. Uh, he appointed two people, one to be a cyber czar uh, or whatever the name of it is in the White House, uh, which was mandated by Congress. And that guy, uh, and it happens to be a guy, will coordinate cyber activity across the government and the private sector. It's a really important role. And the other person, a female, is, will head the cyber function at the Homeland Security Department. Uh, which is our key uh, government defense piece. We also have a cyber command at the Defense Department, but 
but it's the Homeland Department that, again, forges alliances with the private sector. So uh, we're moving in the right direction, but I, I'm, I, I don't think that uh, getting to success is, is going to happen uh, in, in the very near term. And I think it fits into your uh, conception that we need to be innovative and inventive, not to invest in old obsolete ways, but going for the new ways. And yeah. having top scientific uh, minds in our country here, you know, definitely should be able to be the first uh, in, in that position. And I, I forgot one thing though, and that is the questioner also asked about privacy. Um, it is my view, and this is all over my book, that uh, privacy and, and security are not a zero sum game. Um, it, the goal is not to have, you know, to have more of one and then less of the other. The goal is to have more of both. And getting this right is really hard. Uh, uh, and so that is why when we created the director of uh, national intelligence function, we also created a privacy and civil liberties board to be in the mix, to review policy on the front end, to be sure it also protected privacy. And that is why we need any surveillance policies of the United States to fully comply with the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA. And we learned late, including me, and I was a member of Congress, and I was in this so-called gang of eight, the people who get briefed on our most covert actions. We learned late that what the Bush administration was doing initially, in terms of collecting telephone metadata and all the rest of it, did not comply with FISA. They were using authorities uh, issued by the Justice Department, and that was wrong. And we should never do that again. Very, very, very powerful, yes. Well, I think we have exhausted most of the questions that, uh, that have come in. So I think it's my pleasure in concluding on behalf of everybody to thank Representative Harmon, um, Ambassador Don Blinken and Vera Blinken, and uh, to Dean Chano uh, in SIPA. And thank you, Jane, very much for an impressive, truly impressive uh, presentation and discussion. And uh, Vera and Don for uh, uh, sponsoring the series, which um, know, has been tremendous and continues to be a great intellectual powerhouse at Columbia. Well, let me, if I could just add to that, it's a great honor for me to do this and to celebrate the service of two uh, Americans who matter very much and to brag about their son a little bit. I'm sure they hate hearing that, but you know, you got to take it. And, and to celebrate these two, you know, the Columbia Law School and, the, and your center, uh, both Merritt and Jan, uh, because it matters. Uh, that academia uh, full of our best and brightest, not just Americans, but uh, many who come from other places, uh, focus on keeping uh, ways to keep American values and, and American policy uh, in, in, a, you know, in a good place. I mean, it was Ronald Reagan. I'm a card-carrying Democrat, but I salute Ronald Reagan for articulating uh, America as the shining city on a hill. And I love that phrase. And uh, he meant it. And maybe he didn't really achieve it, but he worked on ending the Cold War, give him credit for that. And we haven't been such a shining city uh, for a while. And it is time to shine it up. And uh, the problems are hard. We're just going to have to find the political will uh, in government, uh, in academia, in think tanks, uh, in industry to come up with better answers and then to pull our, 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 our fragmented community together to embrace them. And if we can get there, uh, we've got our shiny city on the hill and we'll build back better. So thank you very much. Extremely well put. Well, thank you very much. And uh, we're you. hoping to see you again at Columbia. Can I just, can I just say a word? Jan? Please. Jan, can I just say a word? Jan, please, uh, definitely, yes. I did just for very myself, thank you all very, very much. For Jane, uh, Jan, and of course, Merritt, this is a very, very worthwhile uh, uh, lecture, and we're very proud to be associated with it. So thank you all very, very much. Thank you. Thank you very, very much, indeed. <laughs>